We are continuing our study of Matthew's gospel this morning. If you would turn with me there. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to start reading in verse 22 in just a couple of minutes. Our passage of scripture this morning begins at nightfall. What has happened in the previous day has been rather dramatic, in fact, rather powerfully dramatic. Um, if you even know just a handful of stories in the life of Jesus Christ, you know probably at least the bones of the story of Jesus feeds the 5,000, the 5,000 plus, maybe nine to 10,000 people there on that hillside. What has happened during this day is that Jesus has performed something miraculous and publicly miraculous in front of a lot of people. And at the end of that story is the disciples gather up what's left over from those baskets and night begins to fall. What Jesus does is interesting. Jesus' reaction to that public miracle of feeding the 5,000 is that he sends the disciples across the lake inside of a boat and then what Jesus does is he seeks out solitude on the side of a mountain to pray. And as we read through our passage, we'll discover that even the solitude that he seeks is, is interrupted by ministry again at the end of our passage. So Jesus climbs up onto a mountain to pray. And then um, in the middle of the night, Jesus decides to take a walk. And that's kind of what happens inside of our passage of Scripture this morning. And during that walk, in the middle of the night, Jesus and his disciples have a conversation, one that specifically takes place between Jesus and this disciple, Peter. Now, as Jesus and Peter have this conversation, it turns into another moment during this day in chapter 14. It turns into another moment of command and obedience and miraculous event. You may recall that's at the core of the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples had told Jesus, the day is nearing its end, send the people to the villages so they can buy food and have something to eat. Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, you feed them. And they gather up what they can and they say, we have, we have five small loaves and two small fish, we can't do it. And Jesus says, well, give that to me. And when they give him that food, he miraculously multiplies it and he feeds the 5,000. A moment of command, give that to me in obedience and then something incredible happens. Well, we have another one of those moments in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, here in the rest of chapter 14. And as we go through that, Peter, of all people, is going to teach us something profound, several profound things, I think, about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And here's a lot of what happens inside of our passage this morning. When Peter, in the middle of the night, recognizes that it is Jesus taking a walk, a walk on water, when, Jesus, when Peter recognizes Jesus, he waits for a clear command from Jesus. In fact, he asks for a command from Christ. Peter knows that if Christ commands him, if Christ calls him, nothing will stop him. Even the storm they find themselves in the middle of, in the middle of the night. So Peter, as he recognizes Jesus, he waits for, he asks for a clear command from Christ. And then Peter displays the courage of discipleship. For all of his humanity, for all of his impetuous behavior, for all of the times when he appears to open his mouth and we want him to shut his mouth, for all those moments in Peter's life, he is a courageous disciple. And if nothing else, I want us to take this kind of question home with us. What does courageous discipleship look like? And we're going to watch that happen in this story with the disciple Peter. We're going to watch Jesus lift a man when he falls. Peter loses track of Jesus in the midst of the storm, but Jesus does not let him sink. Jesus does not lose track of him. Jesus does not let him go, but lifts him back up and puts him back inside of the boat, and I think that's important. That's not just a necessary detail of the story. It's an important detail to the story. Then finally, we watch this. The disciples are so moved by everything that has happened, they openly worship Jesus as the Son of God. In our story, two people walk on water. How incredible is that? A storm is calmed for the second time, but the pinnacle of the story is the worship of Jesus as God. 
Let's begin reading in verse 22. We're going to read through the end of the chapter here in Matthew 14. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. They're blown, actually, to the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all the region and brought to him all who were sick and implored him that they might only touch the fringe of his garments and as many as touched it were made well. So we see what happens during the night and then Matthew gives us a glimpse again of what is becoming common in the life of Christ. What happens when he reaches shore and people recognize him and Jesus begins to touch the lives of those who are around him. But our story begins like this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and he sent them across the sea. Now, the question I'm not gonna answer that I'll just leave in the, as a burr in your saddle is, did Jesus send them into the storm on purpose? <laughs> but he puts them in a boat and he sends them out onto the sea and then Jesus walks up to the top of the mountain to pray. There's a sense of urgency about this passage. Very quickly, Jesus does this. If you read through Mark's gospel, one of the most familiar, one of the most common words inside of that gospel is the word immediately. Immediately this happened, immediately this happened. There's a sense of action, there's a sense of urgency in Mark's gospel. That word does not show up very often in other gospels, especially Matthew's. But at this point, he uses that word and he builds a sense of urgency. We have to move on. I have to go up the side of a hill. You guys have to go across the sea in this boat. There's a sense of urgency. Why is there a sense of urgency at this moment? Well, I think there are a couple of answers to that question at this moment. First of all, Jesus needs to get away to pray. It's been a long day of ministry. Even before he fed them, it says that Jesus spent his time healing as many as were sick there. So it's been a long day of ministry. It's been a long day of work for him and his disciples. On top of that, it all began when Jesus hears about the death of a man that he loves, John the Baptist. So it's been a difficult day. He's heard about the death of someone he loves and he's been involved in ministry all day long and Jesus has to get away to pray. If you're sensitive to it in the Gospels, this kind of moment actually happens fairly often. Jesus will lead the way in praying and showing us the role and the importance of prayer. Not just quick prayers in the moment, not just prayer that we fit into our daily schedule, into our commute in between conversations, as important as those kinds of things are, but Jesus will actually break into his activity. He'll stop and he'll walk away from crowds of people and he'll disappear out into the wilderness or up onto a mountainside in order to pray. I find it important that in, in rebuilding and restoring himself from a day like that, Jesus spends time in prayer. In preparing himself for what's coming next, Jesus will disappear and spend time in prayer. He breaks up his activity like this. Now, I think this is important 
Because you and I, for some reason in our culture, we value busyness. We value activity. We value always doing something. This is how we move forward. This is how we get things done. There's always something to be done. We value busyness. Jesus doesn't. We labor and we work in the kingdom of God and we put our hands to the plow with the things that God has given us to do. But that's different, I think, than busyness. So Jesus leads us in what it means to stop our activity and to spend significant time with God. The more we work without serious time in prayer with God, the thinner we become. So Jesus continues to teach us something about prayer. So why does this happen so quickly? Jesus needs to spend some time in prayer overnight. The other thing that needs to happen is, ju- is this. Jesus needs to get himself and his disciples away from the expectations of the crowd. Now, when John the Baptist, or excuse me, when John the disciple tells this story, he sticks this interesting moment in between the feeding of the 5,000 and the storm on the sea in which Jesus walks on the water. In John chapter 6, verse 15, John the disciple says this, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This crowd of people is so impressed with Jesus and what he is able to do, they're ready to actually make him king by force. And politics just never changes, right? This man puts food in my belly, I will vote for him. (laughs) He's fed us, let's take him. We don't wanna be ruled by Pilate, by Herod, by our Pharisees and scribes, we wanna be ruled by this man. And Jesus perceives that they wanna take him by force and make him king. Well, right now, Jesus is not that kind of king. He is not the kind of king who will take take his kingship by force. His kingship is of a different kind of kingdom, and he doesn't need his disciples wrapped up in the expectations of the crowd, so he moves them away. He literally puts them in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, away from the expectations of the crowd, and he removes himself from the expectations of the crowd. He's not that kind of king of king. The time will come when Jesus will actually allow a crowd in Jerusalem to openly recognize him as king of kings and lord of lords, but that moment is not yet. So he and his disciples are removed from the expectations of the crowd and night falls. And what happens next is something again that is probably very familiar to us. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Other gospels, as they tell this story, they put uh, the disciples in the boat roughly halfway across the lake. So as the wind blows and the storm rises and they're fighting against the winds and the waves, there's no clear necessary direction where should we go next but forward where Christ has sent us. They're in the middle of the lake. There's no easy way out of this storm. And in fact, they're probably actually blown off course a little bit by it. And then Matthew just quite simply says, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus comes walking on the water. The fourth watch of the night happens between 3 and 6 a.m., so somewhere maybe around 3 o'clock in the morning, in the middle of a storm, fighting against the waves, the disciples see something that they just did not expect to see. Jesus has spent the night praying, and he decides to take a walk in a way that only Jesus can take a walk, (laughs) right across the Sea of Galilee. And as they see it, the reaction, I think, is a perfectly natural human reaction. It's a ghost. The Greek word that they use is the word that we get phantasm from. That's what they're seeing. They, They don't know what they're seeing. They don't understand. Who's seen that before? So this is their reaction. It's a ghost. They're shocked and they're afraid both by the storm and by what they think they are seeing. And so this is their reaction to them as Jesus walks on the water. As I was going through this passage of scripture, I was reminded of 
A handful of conversations that I've had through the years with people who um, are devout atheists or people who are working very hard to deny the truth and reality of Scripture in Christ. And it's interesting to me that uh, quite often this miracle gets mocked. This miracle gets picked on. Oh, really? So your God walks on water. Don't you know that that you know, breaks every possible law of nature and isn't that a silly, trite little thing for God to do by walking on the water? I don't know why, but this miracle gets mocked a lot by a lot of people. And in those conversations, a couple of times, I've been able to sort of uh, continue with these kinds of thoughts as well. Well, if the God of the Bible exists, the one who is described in these pages exists, he created the universe, everything, out of nothing. And if that God exists, a unique act of buoyancy is not gonna bother him at all. The question is not, can God walk on water? The question is, does this God exist? And if so, then this night is really not all that bothersome to him. Well, the mockery of the miracle does another thing as well. I think it minimizes the disciples' situation here in the middle of the night. I think it minimizes, in fact, our situation. In a boat, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm. Where the disciples are, they need someone who is greater than the storm. When you and I find ourselves in a boat, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm, we need the same thing. We need someone who is greater than the storm. I think maybe some of us need to hear this. There's, I think there's, there, there are layers and layers and layers of things to hear inside of this passage of Scripture. Sometimes in our storms, God seems so far away. And it feels as if we will be overwhelmed by what's going on around us. Something we didn't even necessarily choose. Remember, Jesus shoved them off of land and sent them out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. And God feels so far away, and yet Jesus shows up anyway. His eyes were never off the disciples. We need someone greater than the storm. And we have someone, in fact, who can walk over the waves of the storm. And I find that beautiful. The disciples cry out in fear, and Jesus responds by saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, we have to sort of expunge our minds of the images that we normally see with Jesus walking on the water. We get this image of a glassy lake. It's like this, it's like this, uh, uh, it's like a lake of ice and he's walking across this glassy lake. We have to get that out of our heads. The winds and the waves, they're doing this. The ship is doing this. Jesus, as he walks on the waves, is doing this. The wind is blowing, the rain is falling. This entire conversation is shouted. In fact, a couple of times it says, and then he cried out, Lord, save me. In order to make you feel that, I'm going to scream the rest of this passage. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. When our text says, it is I, Jesus uses the Greek version of the Old Testament language, I am. Do not be afraid. The disciples are naturally afraid of their situation. It is in the middle of the night during the storm and in their confusion that Jesus says, do not be afraid. This is a command that we've run across now several times already in Matthew's gospel. The more you read the gospels, the more you read scripture, the more you run into this command, do not be afraid, and there is always a common theme when that command is given and the common theme is this I have every earthly reason to be afraid but now because of Jesus I have every good reason to not be afraid that's the common theme that's the only reason that command makes sense is that I am in my nature fearful Christ walks into it and says, do not be afraid. Fear in our hearts arises for all kinds of reasons and it manifests itself in all kinds of 
sometimes very ugly and difficult ways. And here they're battling the unknown, here they're battling the uncontrollable, but Jesus not only knows, he is in complete control of that storm, and the disciples belong to the man who's walking on the waves and not bothered by it at all. If all of this is really true about Jesus Christ, that he really is bigger than that storm and he really is walking on the waves, if that really is true about him, how should I respond? And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Don't miss the middle of that sentence. <clears throat> command me to come to you. I want to come to where you are. Command me and I will come. And I will follow you out onto the water. If all of this really is true about Jesus, maybe we really will obey his commands. Maybe we really will follow him. Maybe we really will get out of the boat and go to where he is. I find it interesting. Peter knows that it has to be Jesus who commands him to walk out onto the water. Otherwise, getting out of the boat is lunacy. Otherwise, getting out of the boat is taking his life into his own hands. But because it's Jesus who commands him to get out of the boat, it's not lunacy, it's obedience, right? Because it's Jesus, it's obedience. It doesn't matter what's going on outside the boat. Christ commands him, come, and he comes. It's not risk-taking for the sake of it, but it is risk-taking by following Jesus where he is already walking. Without Jesus, the storm is a chance to drown, but with Jesus, it is a chance to walk on water. Again, there's so much, I think, in this passage that, that maybe some of us need to hear. In the middle of a storm, we all very naturally seek the safety of a place like the boat. They were safe inside of the boat. But what happens is Jesus comes walking on the water and Peter sees something and Christ calls him out and Peter's able to step out of the boat. We seek that safety, but what if in the middle of the storm we followed Jesus instead? So very simply at this moment, Jesus commands him to come out onto the water. I wonder in my mind's eye as I go through this passage of scripture if during this, con this shouted conversation when Jesus hears that it's Peter's voice, he doesn't just have this kind of wry smile on his face. Well, of course it's Peter who wants to walk on water. Thomas would never ask this. Judas most certainly would never ask this. But Peter wants to walk on water. So during a storm at three in the morning because of a shouted conversation, Peter throws his legs over the side of the boat and he begins to walk on water. The storm rages on. That's important. When his feet touch the water, it's still doing this. The storm doesn't calm at this point. What happens is he's able to walk out on the water to where Jesus is because Christ commanded and Peter obeyed. So the storm rages on like it is in the nursery right now. <laughs> but for the moment, Peter's eyes are on Jesus and he walks. Then the text tells us, so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. This to me maybe is unfortunately the most well-known, the most famous moment of this story. Jesus, or excuse me, Peter moves his attention from Jesus to the storm and he moves from walking on water to actually sinking out there in the water as he normally would have. Just a moment ago, the storm was background noise but now it occupies Peter's attention. This is now what he sees instead of Jesus. His eyes are off of Christ and onto the storm, and he begins to sink. 
Matthew's image of discipleship here just could not be clearer. We are safe. We are always safe. With our eyes on Christ and in obedience to him, we find ourselves in danger when we take our eyes off of him. One of my favorite authors, Dallas Willard, likes to say, this world is the safest place for the Christian. It doesn't feel that way sometimes. But you and I belong to Jesus Christ. And in his hands, you and I are safe. So at Christ's command, Peter obeys and he walks on water. Peter begins to doubt. He begins to sink. And then at that moment, he is lifted. He is saved by Jesus Christ. Christ does not let him sink out there in the water and in the waves. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt that phrase, little faith, we've seen that a couple of times and we'll see it again. It's a little noun that Jesus uses for his disciples. He calls them little faiths. It's like a nickname he gives them. Oh, you people who believe so little. <laughs> there is so much more for, for you in faith in me. Why did you doubt? The word that Jesus uses is provocative. It means to be of two minds of a situation. It means to doubt my conviction about something. So he was looking at Christ and then he looked at the waves and when he began to be of two minds about the situation, Peter begins to sink into the Sea of Galilee. Well, John Ortberg, the uh, pastor and the author, he was commenting on this passage of scripture and he asks a good question. And the question is this. Did Peter fail? That's a good question. His first answer to the question, I think, is a magnificent answer. His answer is this. I think there are 11 larger failures still sitting inside of the boat. <laughs> of course, Peter should not have taken his eyes off of Jesus. But Peter was the only disciple who walked on water. And... He was the disciple who learned while sinking in the waves that he was going to be lifted by Jesus and put back into the boat. I love it. The rest of the disciples in that moment, they experienced neither, but they stayed in the relative safety of the boat. I can imagine the disciples a little bit later on in life sitting around a meal and one of them goes, Peter, what did it feel like to sink out there in the middle of the waves? And Peter says, all he has to say is this. Well, I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have actually walked on water? Who's walked on water? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Obedience to Jesus Christ takes courage. It just does. It takes assurance that Christ has commanded it. And it takes assurance that Christ will complete the work that he has started. Obedience takes courage. And this is what I want us wrestling with this week. What shape will my courage take? What is it that I am supposed to do, to be? What is it I'm supposed to let go of? What edge of what boat should I be stepping over because I know Christ has called me to do it. What shape will my courage take? What is Christ calling me to? What can Christ do if we as a church step out of the boat? As I was thinking through this this week, I was reminded over and over and over again of what started happening in the year 2011 to me and a, a group of people. I sat down around a table with a couple of gals who um, had decided that what they wanted to do was start a home for girls in the U.S. who were rescued from human trafficking. And I thought, you know what, that's something I'd like to support. I'll sit down with them and I'll ask them, how can I help you? So that's how I went into that conversation. I walked out of that conversation, the chairman of the board for Sarah's home. You've got to be careful who you talk to, right? <laughs> As we did research on what it meant to build a home for girls who were pulled out of human tra traffic in the US, we discovered that there was almost 
nobody doing it. Of maybe the 100 to 200,000 200, girls in the US who were caught in the sex slave industry, there might have been 50 beds available for those girls when they were rescued. So Sarah's home was on the tip of the spear and it was doing something that almost nobody else had done up to that point. And when we had our first organizational meeting, we actually had a missionary with us who's done this kind of thing overseas. The first words out of his mouth were, you probably should not do this. (laughs) Well, we did it anyway. (laughs) But as we did this, we didn't have a home. We didn't have a place to go. Well, our network was sitting on a church that had been empty, and so they deeded it to us for a dollar. Well, now we had an old church that needed to be renovated, and we had almost no money. We were able to renovate two, a church, a parsonage, and an office building with missionary help and missions team and volunteer help, and we completely renovated those buildings. The city there where we were uh, building, rebuilding Sarah's home, they were unhappy with us. So we had a town hall meeting to explain what we were doing to them in which I did not get shot dead, thank God. (laughs) We walked out of that room thinking, I probably could have been shot dead inside of that meeting. Here I am. (laughs) We had no money, we got a building renovated. We had no friends in the community, we won a lot of them over we didn't have anybody who were employees and employees showed up ready ready to raise their own funding and on and on and on the story went and we opened our doors and girls began to show up at sarah's home continue to pray for sarah's home because it is still a storm raging around that place what's possible on the other side of obedience what is possible on the other side of saying i don't know anybody who's ever done this but Christ is calling us to do it. So let's just go do it. The other 11 disciples stayed in the relative safety of the boat, but we learn later on in their lives that the disciples learn this lesson. The book of Acts tells us what happens with these disciples after the Holy Spirit falls. In Acts chapter four, the persecution that had fallen on Christ is now falling on the disciples and on the church. And when they gather together after a moment of persecution, they begin to pray. And I want us to hear part of their prayer as a result of being obedient to what Christ has given them. Acts chapter four, beginning in verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. This was their prayer when the storm began to rage. Give us courage. Spirit falls, the place is physically shaken, and they walk out in boldness. Isn't that beautiful? Another man in church history who was a bold disciple of Christ, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I was reminded of a passage in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, as I was reading through this this week. At one point early on in that book, Bonhoeffer says, you know, it is true when we say that those who believe obey. Those who believe in Jesus Christ will obey him. He really is who he says he is and he's commanded me to do this. He's commanded me these things in scriptures so I'm going to go do it. He says, now that's true, but the deeper truth that we learn as Christians is this. Those who obey believe. There is something else to be learned about the power of God on the other side of our obedience. Peter learned that he walked on water when he followed Christ out of the boat. Peter learned that Christ was not going to let him drown, but lifted him back up and put him back in safety when he began to sink under the waves. There is something else to be learned. We learn it in a new way on the other side of obeying Christ. What does courageous discipleship look like? Discipleship and obedience and courage even in a storm. And we watch it actually turn into worship as the passage ends. 
And I'd like to suggest to you, and you can kind of rattle this around in your heads for a little while, it may be true that those who obey greatly worship greatly. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. When they call him the Son of God, this is about as clear a statement of deity as the disciples could produce. This is not just a magnificent rabbi, someone powerfully used by God. This is the promised Son of God who is with us. Matthew very simply says, and they worshiped him. Now in Matthew's gospel, this is interesting because so far, wise men have worshiped Jesus. A leper has worshiped Jesus. A local ruler who needed his daughter healed has worshiped Jesus. This, however, is the first time in the gospel that Matthew tells us the disciples worshiped Jesus. This isn't an emotional moment. This isn't ginned up by their fear being released. After all, they've seen Jesus calm a storm before. They've seen him do this. But it is at this moment, the culmination of all of these things brings the disciples to a moment of actual worship. It's an act of adoration that is reserved only for God. It is a moment of realization their eyes opening up about who Jesus is. So this isn't an emotional moment. In fact, we recognize as Jesus uses the same word early on in the desert being tempted by the devil, the very last temptation essentially is Jesus worship me and I will give you all of the kingdoms of this earth. And Jesus tells him, you're only supposed to worship God alone and serve him only. Even if it means the cross, we worship God alone. So this isn't an emotional moment. This is a moment of realization for these disciples. And I think it's not just that Jesus walked on water or calmed the storm. I think it's a culmination of the day. It's a culmination of his command and obedience and what happens because of it. It's a culmination of the things that they're seeing happen at the hands of Jesus Christ. And they now have these instances in the last day of command and obedience and miraculous intervention by God. They now know that they can follow Jesus out into the storm, and if their eyes are on him, they will walk. And they know that they will never be lost by Christ. They know that they are completely safe in the storm with Jesus. Maybe it is the case that those who dare greatly for Christ find themselves worshiping greatly. They step out of the boat and there's only one way I will not sink and that is if Jesus does it. So that's what I'm gonna spend my time doing. I'm gonna follow him and I'm gonna pray, Jesus, do it, Jesus, do it. It can't be me. I wonder sometimes if our worship is boring because our discipleship is dull. Maybe we need to step out of a boat. Maybe we need a moment in our lives where it can only be Jesus. This Jesus who calls us to follow after him is the one and only God. He is the son of God. He is God in flesh. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, and he is the God who holds every one of his children in the palm of his hand. And he is a God who deserves every ounce of my worship. Let's pray.